Howdy, and thanks for stopping by today so that we can talk a little bit about Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which represented his first attempt to redefine the Civil War. Now before we get to the Emancipation Proclamation, we need to establish what was going on beforehand. The Civil War started off for Lincoln as a very limited war. His aim was to preserve the Union. Keep in mind, everything else is secondary. When it comes down to it throughout the Civil War, Lincoln has one goal that remains constant, and that is to preserve the Union. Now, Lincoln... Now, Lincoln really had no idea what he was getting into at the time. In fact, when his War Department called for troops, they called for 75,000 troops to serve for a period of three months, if we even need them that long. Lincoln wasn't aware this war was going to last four years, much longer than he expected. Over 600,000 lives are going to be taken in this war. Lincoln had no idea. For him at the time, it was just about putting the Union back together. But putting the Union back together was going to prove to be a much more difficult task than Lincoln had imagined at first. The North had a three-pronged strategy for victory, which was known as the Anaconda Plan. What the North had in mind to do was to first blockade Confederate ports. Second, divide the Confederacy at the Mississippi and establish that river as a channel for northern commerce. Third was the kicker, to capture Richmond, the Confederate capital. Now, it doesn't seem like capturing Richmond would be the hardest of these things. After all, it's barely a stone's throw away from Washington, D.C., but in 1862, Lincoln's generals in Virginia run into a man named Robert E. Lee who lays multiple whippings on the Union armies, so much so that he gets confident enough to invade the North, where he engages his opponent, General McClellan, in what is really, for all practical purposes, an inconclusive battle at Antietam. Now, let's take a look at this battle of Antietam. Antietam has the distinction of being the bloodiest single day of the Civil War. Gettysburg was a bloodier battle, but that lasted three days. So on no other day in U.S. history has more American blood been spilt. Over 20,000 killed, wounded, captured, and missing. The battle itself was a tactical draw, with neither side destroying the other, both armies being largely intact uh, by the end, and Lee going on an orderly retreat. Now, the North can claim victory very easily because, of course, the North had the battlefield. Then again, when two teams play basketball, the away team always goes home after the game. Doesn't always mean the away team lost. Lincoln realizes that McClellan had failed to deliver at Antietam. He couldn't be fooled. One of the first things Lincoln did after the battle was to fire his commanding general. Lincoln was not impressed with the results, but the Republican press was. If you look here, you can see a picture from Harper's Weekly of General McClellan going into Frederick, Maryland and seeing all these crowds. He's liberated the city. So although it may not be a real victory, with a little bit of PR and spin, we could do something with it. And so Lincoln has an opportunity here. This war has been going on for more than a year now, much longer than Lincoln ever anticipated. And keep in mind, although the North is doing well in the Western theater, it's starting to look like the North is never going to be able to defeat Lee and take Virginia. Lincoln can no longer fight this war with a hand tied behind his back. It's time for something drastic if the Confederacy is to be defeated and the Union is going to be preserved. So, is Antietam a chance for Lincoln to redefine the war? Perhaps to make this war about preserving the Union and ending slavery? Well, as much as Lincoln might have wanted to end slavery personally, Lincoln, as President of the United States, had a lot of factors to consider. By the way, Abraham Lincoln may have been the greatest politician 
ever to occupy the Oval Office. And Lincoln has a number of political concerns in mind, uh, and three things in particular that are barriers to emancipation. The first of these being the Constitution. I always keep one close. Didn't even realize that one was there, but it is. Constitution of the United States, which prior to the introduction of the 13th Amendment in 1865, did not allow the federal government to legislate concerning slavery in the several states. Lincoln had no constitutional authority to end slavery. The second thing in Lincoln's way was the border states. Were the border states? Was the border states? I don't know if I've got a grammar Nazi out there. Uh, comment. Let me know which one. Okay, but the border states were in the way of emancipation. Because keep in mind, the Civil War wasn't just as easy as, okay, slave states to the Confederacy, free states to the Union, let's all fight each other. Most of the slave states seceded, but you had these border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, that had remained in the Union and continued to have slavery. And if Lincoln is going to turn this war into a war about emancipation, he's going to tick a lot of people off in these places, and he has to consider that. Uh, wouldn't want Kentucky joining the Confederacy or anything like that. Now, the third thing in Lincoln's way would be his central goal of preserving the Union. If Lincoln expands the aim of this war and gives the message to the South that if you are defeated, slavery is also defeated, this is going to make the South fight even harder. Possibly will make it more difficult to win. But as Lincoln is seeing it at this point in time, the North is not winning. That's something to keep in mind, that with all of the victories that Robert E. Lee's scoring, victory was not certain for the North, in spite of all of the advantages that they started out with, uh, with population, equipment, and money. Lincoln had to be really careful about this because he had to walk a fine line because on one hand he had the abolitionist wing of his own party, the more radical faction that wanted to see the war escalated and then on the other end he, there were plenty of people in the north who did not want the war to be about slavery. So when Abraham Lincoln was confronted by members of his own party in a northern newspaper about not doing enough to end slavery Lincoln replied in a public letter to Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, where he explained his position on the war and slavery. Let's see what Honest Abe has to say. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save this union. Lincoln's trying to make himself very clear in this letter to the editor. This is a war for one thing and one thing only, to preserve the union. Now, Honest Abe's not being quite so honest here because this is exactly one month before the Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln's already got this thing in his desk drawer. He's just waiting for the right time to release it. And he needs to let these border states know that this is not going to threaten you. So after the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln sees his chance. Uh, we've got something resembling a victory. Robert E. Lee has come across Yankee troops on the field and has not decisively defeated them. So maybe it's time for at least a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. This was issued on September 22nd of 1862, 100 days before the New Year, five days after the Battle of Antietam. And Abraham Lincoln, in this proclamation, wrote, 
that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. So it's September 22nd right now. I'm going to give you 100 days, South. And if you're still fighting in 100 days, I'm going to start freeing your slaves. Now, the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation could be read as a warning to the South. Look here, South. I'm tired of your nonsense. And you better put the guns down, or else it's about to get real. And note the date here. January 1st, 1863. Now, keep in mind that Lincoln, more than anything, would like the Union to be preserved and the war to be over. So there's something about this date that helps me to remember it. First of all, come on, it's New Year's. It shouldn't be that hard. But I think about when I was little and my parents would start counting to three. You may remember this. The finger goes up. One. I stand my ground, wondering, will she keep counting? Two. I'm starting to wonder now, okay, I'm getting ready to run off and do what I'm told, but I think I'm going to wait because I was a stubborn kid. And I think that maybe she'll pull up that two and a half, and then, then it's time to stop running because I didn't want to get spanking. I mean, I, I was growing up in the 80s back when you could actually do that. So Lincoln is really counting to three for the South. One, two. Three, okay, so 1863, then he's going to start freeing slaves. Now, of course, 1-1-1863, one, one, I know that it's a 1 and a 1, but 1 plus 1 equals 2. Look, if you have a better memory device, use that, but I doubt that you do. So on January 1st, 1863, this war is going to change. Now, by what authority is Lincoln freeing slaves? As we've noted, the Constitution at the time did not give Lincoln the authority to free slaves in a slave state. But Lincoln writes in the Emancipation Proclamation that he is doing this by the power vested in him as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion. So when it comes down to it, this Emancipation Proclamation is a necessary war measure. Lincoln is saying, look, as Commander-in-Chief, I'm in charge of suppressing this rebellion. And if I don't start freeing slaves, the Union cause is in jeopardy. So I'm doing this not because I want to, but because I have to. Of course, there are exceptions, because Lincoln is not freeing slaves everywhere. As you can see here, he's noting that all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be free. So there's a prerequisite for any slaves to be freed that this place has to be in rebellion against the United States. So let's take a look at our map. You can see here the areas covered and the areas not covered. Now, of course, you've got the border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, soon to be West Virginia, a state that was created during the Civil War. Now, then let's take a look at the Confederacy. Notice that the entire state of Tennessee is exempted. This is because the state of Tennessee has already been pacified and is being occupied by Union troops at the time. Note that the Union has also taken New Orleans. So Southeast Louisiana is also not covered by the Emancipation Proclamation. And we also have a few counties in Tidewater, Virginia that were occupied by the Union Army at the time. So wherever the Union is, the Emancipation Proclamation is not. And wherever the Union is not, the Emancipation Proclamation is. So strictly speaking, 
on January 1st, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation took effect, zero slaves were freed. Well, then what's the big deal? Why are we even talking about this if the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single slave? Well, it didn't free a single slave that day. But as time progressed and the Union Army went further into the Confederate territory, the Emancipation would be read every time the Union Army went to another slave plantation. By the way, slaves, you're free. And so this further destabilizes the Confederacy. Uh, so while no slaves were freed on that day, plenty of slaves were freed over the next two and a half years. So as far as why, first of all, it destabilizes the Confederacy, but second of all, the Emancipation Proclamation strengthened the Union's moral cause. Let's see how Abraham Lincoln closed this Emancipation Proclamation. He did so by writing, and upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God the gracious favor of Almighty God for an act of justice. Lincoln here is making it clear that from this point forward, this is not just a war to subjugate the South and keep them from being independent. The North has the moral high ground because the North is fighting against slavery. Now, while slavery was popular in the American South, it wasn't popular in the European countries that the South was trying to get uh, to assist them. So when Jefferson Davis's government uh, goes over to England and says, hey, England, we'd like a little help from you, the English have to say sorry as much as we would like to. We can't help you. Our people just don't like slavery so much. And if this war is about slavery, we can't get on the wrong side of that. Now, I'm a historian. I know that Queen Elizabeth wasn't Queen of England in the 19th century, but would you rather see a picture of Queen Victoria? See, sometimes aesthetics matter. Keep that in mind. And finally, in addition to destabilizing the Confederacy and giving the North the moral high ground and keeping foreign powers from getting involved on the side of the Confederacy, the Emancipation Proclamation paved the way for the formation of African American military units. About 180,000 African American soldiers ended up serving in the Union Army during the Civil War. So before the Emancipation Proclamation, the North was fighting a limited war to preserve the Union. After the Emancipation Proclamation, the North is fighting a war to preserve the Union and to eradicate slavery. So Lincoln has not changed his war aim. He has expanded his war aim. And from that point on, we will see the progression toward in 1865, the 13th Amendment, and the Civil War ending and slavery ending with it. And of course, you're more than welcome to check out my website. Follow me on Twitter. I'm all over the place. Feel free to join me. Until next time.